right, everybody, welcome back to the Millennial Sales Podcast. This is your host, Tommy Tahoe Alemo. This is a show where salespeople come to up their craft, to learn the skills, make more money, get promoted, whatever it is you're trying to do in your sales career. This is the place to learn about it. Uh, pumped for this episode today. Doing a little bit of a switch up. Going throwback, way back Wednesday, throwback Thursday, flashback Friday, whatever day it is. We're listening to an episode from a little bit ago, a couple years ago, one of my all-time favorite podcasts that I've ever done. And, you know, the sound quality might not be as good as, as it is in some of the, the current episodes. Maybe the questions asked were or weren't as good. I'm not sure. But the content is amazing. Um, and back in the day, I used to host this, co-host this with one of my friends. So you hear two hosts in this. Shout out to Brian Warner. And this uh, this episode is with Mike Dr. Michael Gervais. Dr. Gervais is a sports psychologist. And so he's worked with Olympic athletes. He works very closely with the Seattle Seahawks. He's worked with um, other professional athletes in different sports. He's worked with extreme sports athletes. So one of his claims to fame was he worked with Felix Bumgardner, who had the highest uh, free drop. So he pretty much went to almost outer space and just jumped out of a plane and he broke the world record for the farthest free fall. Um, and, and Dr. Gervais was the person to mentally help him get there where he could have the courage and the, the, um, you know, the calm and the composure to actually go out there and get it. So uh, we talked to, to Gervais about everything as it relates to psychology, sports, ultimate peak performance. He just tells some really cool stories. And here's the thing. The things that Russell Wilson has been doing on the Seahawks for the last 10 years, the things that Kerry Walsh Jennings has been doing in Olympic volleyball, the things that Felix Bumgarner did to jump out of that plane, and the things that you're doing in sales or entrepreneurship are all the same in a lot of ways. It's the same mentality, the same habits, the same drive, ambition, all these different things that you need to be successful. If you can be successful in one area of life, you can do it in many others. And so I have taken things that uh, Michael Gervais has has talked about uh, to help me out in a lot of areas of life. I think you will too. Um, you could definitely check out more about him. He's got a great podcast called Finding Mastery. I'd highly suggest you check that out as well. But without further ado, let's get into my conversation with Dr. Michael Gervais. Let's go. Michael, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, guys. Thank you. We're really excited to have you. Now, let's dive right into it. You've been working with the Seahawks for a couple years now. And you've said in the past that humans can train three things. They can train their craft, their body, and their mind. Now, with the Seahawks, I'm guessing you tackle the latter. Could you speak to what that experience has been like? Sure. What, what part of the experience? The training of those three or the time spent at the Seahawks? I think, you know, what are some of your biggest takeaways just from working with them over the past few years? It must be an incredible experience. Yeah, it's been fantastic. So... Um, it's been about five or six seasons now, and you know there's there's something very important that takes place when leadership is very clear about the philosophy and the ideas to to govern the culture of the organization. And Coach Carroll has done an extraordinary job of articulating with great simplicity very complicated ideas on how to become the best version of yourself. And so, from a cultural standpoint. What we've, what we've experienced is that his intellectual property and know-how and genius really is about how to create a culture. Obviously, he's got the X's and O's and command of that, but how to create a culture where people want to become their very best. And then five or six seasons ago, uh, he added me to their culture, which is uh, you know, a, another lens and a deeper lens on the mindset skills and the psychological principles that would amplify people to be able to become their best. So you've got the culture and the mindset skills now embedded and infused together. And it's gone so well for us that uh, there's a good story that I'd like to share with you is that heading into our first Super Bowl, it was about six weeks before we were going into our first Super Bowl and we're in the hallway up at the training center. And coach says, do you feel it? Do you feel what's happening here? I said, it's amazing. And then he, we're just like kind of nodding our heads like, God, it feels good around here. 
And what that means is like people are, are deeply optimistic. They're looking forward to the future. They're handling adversity well. They've got that right chip on their shoulder to be um, a dogged competitor, incredibly resilient. It's like this, just this great togetherness that was taking place. And he, he, without hesitation, he said, do you think anyone else outside of sport would be interested in what we're doing? And before I could get anything out of my mouth, he says, let's just write it down. And so what he, what he was saying was, let's write down what you're doing, what I'm doing, what we're doing together. And so we went away. We wrote our stuff down. We came back. We found the commonalities, like we're just to really harden and to clarify what we had done together for um, the, previ- the previous two years. And then we shared that those insights with the CEO of Microsoft and Satya. And Satya was like, yes, <laughs> this, is, this is exactly what we're looking for. Like wh- what we've done is we pull back the curtain and shown you how, what he's come to learn in his 40 years of coaching and what I've come to learn about. Uh, the 20 years being an, uh, a sports psychologist and how to switch on a culture and switch on the minds of people inside of it who want to be great. And so now we built this on the back of that, we built this fun little business um, where we're completely digital at this point. And um, so we can be at scale and it's been this just great ride, a, a fantastic ride. Man, that's, that's awesome. And, um, you know, to the elephant in the room for me is that I've been a diehard Patriots fan my whole life, but, oh. but as I know, I know, I know that's like, that's yeah. like a four letter word for you guys. But, um, but my point is that, you know, when I have dug deeper into, um, you and, and Pete's philosophies, I've actually started to, you know, I, I can't tell my dad this, but, but become a little bit of a Seahawks fan too. And it's hard not to admire what you guys have done. Um, so I'm curious, like when you first stepped in there, um, and started working with Pete, like what were the first steps to starting to create that dynamic culture? So when I stepped in, the culture was already in place. And I, the way that I think about my contribution was to observe, to learn, to really understand, and then find the ways with my, my lenses of sports psychology, where can I amplify, strengthen, and adjust? So it was all, like the clay was already well formed. And not to be esoteric, like I can make that hopefully maybe more concrete, is that there's a guiding philosophy in the organization that there wouldn't be one person in the organization that wouldn't know this phrase and actually what it means. So the philosophy set up by Pete is to always compete. So the the core philosophy in the organization is competition. And then he goes into incredible depth to be able to articulate what type of competitor what the style of competition looks like for the organization and um, and then backs it up with the mental skills to be able to be that person on a regular basis. And the mental skills, like it, it, we don't, this is going to sound, I don't know, a little odd, but you don't need mental skills when everything's going your way, right? Like everything's going your way. Mental, we want to front load the training of our mind to be able to deal well and to deal quickly with things that aren't going our way. And so that has been what I would consider one of the core um, key gems, if you will, the cornerstone gems of the organization is that they're able to deal with things intensely, uh, emotionally, so we're not holding back, as well as do it as quickly as I've seen an organization do, especially an organization with you know, alpha males. And, it's, uh, and so that's been incredible as well. I can't even imagine. And just going back to your first part, always compete. Tom and I ran a marathon two weeks ago, and from miles 20 to 23, all Tom was saying out loud like a crazy person was always compete. We've watched Pete Carroll's uh, speech at USC probably about 15 times, so that definitely resonates with us. Yeah, that's that, I mean, that's extraordinary. So what you were doing is when it was getting hard, you had something to go to. Yeah. And that's the front loading that I'm talking about. And you can front load. So that's like you were front loading. Um, a value-based system so that you'd have something to say to yourself and it meant something to you. And that's essentially self-talk is what we're talking about there. And that, that all can be trained. And what we've come to learn is that confidence is one of the cornerstones for great performance, right? Having that, that swag, that belief, that inner knowing that you can adjust to whatever comes up and you ha- do have the inner skills and the outer skills to go the distance, to manage the, the, the intensity of the environment. And that confidence comes from only one place, which is what you say to yourself. So we're very particular about 
the precision of language, both inner language and body language. And if you were to walk through the Seattle Seahawks, uh, you would notice the precision of language and the precision of body language, um, how important that is. And you you mentioned it earlier. It's you know when things are going well, it's easy to have that that belief, that positive self talk. But you know we had a, you know a rough day on Tuesday for whatever reason. We just weren't feeling it. Kind of felt down. And we know you folks had a uh, you know a heart wrenching loss a few years back. So do you have any tips or tricks on you know day after that loss? Everyone's feeling down. How do you make sure that we don't go down that spiral of of negative self talk and woe is me? Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, for sure. Perspective. So we all, we, the, the path of becoming wise or having deep perspective and insight is you have to earn it. And you have to earn it by becoming incredibly aware of your inner experience and then matching that inner experience with the person that you want to become. And, and if I pull back one more layer on that is that it's through pain we change and it's through uncomfortableness is how – I'm sorry. I, I got my, my thing confused here. It's through pain is – oh, no. I said it right. I, I said it just backwards how I normally say it. It's through, through pain is why we change. Uncomfortableness is how we grow. Mm-hmm. So after that experience, there was pain in the organization. And the pain came from lack of perspective. And so you have to earn perspective. You have to earn insight and wisdom by listening deeply, by living in the present moment, by not escaping – from the present moment, from drugs or drama or whatever. And that is something that the organization had the opportunity to go through together. And it's not easy. And so with great awareness, you can choose thoughts better. You can listen to yourself more accurately. You can adjust to the the, the outside influences saying, yeah, but you shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have done this. And only if, well, the truth was that that's how it went down. And now I need to make a decision about how I want to live my life with these, you know, particular facts in place. That it was a last minute loss in a dramatic fashion. And then the the last piece that I'll share with you is that the brain is incredible. And there are no redundancies in the brain. So the same parts of the brain that are responsible for grief are also active during football loss or basketball loss or baseball loss or loss of a phone. It's the same <laughs> The same centers are taking place when we lose mm-hmm. as opposed to grief. So it is very difficult for the emotional brain uh, um, to feel it. I'm sorry, let me say it more clearly. It's easy for the emotional brain to feel hijacked by intensity on, for the centers that are designed for grief. And so it literally feels like somebody is dying or something has died when really it's just, it is a loss of one game, hopefully in a, in a, in a long career of uh, opportunities to test yourself. When isn't, you know, the redundancy of the brain, isn't that the beauty of, of the power of visualization or imagery, right? I mean, just like the mind or the brain doesn't know the difference between the loss of a phone or the loss of a, uh, a loved one. It also doesn't know the difference of when we're imagining a positive state um, or not. So could you speak to imagery and how you, why that's different than visual, visualization to you? Yeah, nice, nice work, guys, on some research here. Yes. And so the word visualization is a word that's used often in the term and uh, in the science. And there's nothing wrong with the term. But for me, it, it just conjures up one sense, which is the visual senses. And the most effective way to do performance imagery or healing imagery or whatever imagery you or whatever word you want to put in front of imagery is that you want to create an environment in your imagination that is so rich that it feels as if you're in it. And so that means you, we want to enhance the uh, perception of, of smell, of taste, of touch, of, of sound, of feel. All of that is part of the experience when we're lost in imagination. So just using the word imagination or imagery reminds people that we need to create as lifelike of a sensation as we can. And from science, we're not exactly sure how this works. We're not exactly sure how when you close your eyes and you create a vivid image that you are actually able to lay myelin sheath across the nervous system of the muscles that you're wanting to activate in sequence. 
It's phenomenal. And myelin sheath is a fancy word for um, the fatty tissue that goes over the nerves. And the more fatty tissue you have over the nerves, the faster and more efficient impulses travel from your brain to particular parts of your body, your arm, your leg, whatever. And we're not sure how it works, but we do know that it does work. And so, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's it's really incredible, but it requires deep focus. And right now, in the next phase of uh, modern times, deep focus is going to be one of the most scarce commodities. And that's because we are distracted. We're distracted by all the external noise. We live in a 24 by 7 digital world that's happening. We're attached to our our, uh, digital devices and we're checking our phone more than we ever imagined. And so we are multitasking to keep up. Multitasking is the opposite. There are no effective multitaskers. It's the opposite of deep focus. So deep focus is the entrance into flow state. It's also the requirement for great performance imagery. Performance imagery helps shape the the brain and the body, and it also helps to familiarize ourselves with expert performance. Yeah, that that's interesting. I'm glad that you brought that up because one thing that I wanted to to ask you about was you talk a bit about um, you know living in the past or living in the future versus living in the now. And you know we were Ryan and I were talking about that earlier, and it's like why is it so hard? to just live in the now because we know that's when flow state happens. We know that's when your best work is done, whether you're um, you know, in business or football or whatever it may be. But why is that so hard and, and how do we get ourselves there more frequently? Okay. So that's a really deep and thoughtful question. And the answer is not easy, but there are a couple points of view that we can take a look at. One is our brain is also creating novelty. It's creating new things that are new. And it's almost like we get a hit of incredible drugs when something new and complicated and fresh and visual is is part of the mix. So we love it. We love the new. We love what social media does to our brain. It's almost literally as if we are introducing a, a drug that is subtle on drip and available at any time for the entire world. Most of us are not prepared for it. Yeah. <laughs> and then when you add on top of it, you know, the young brains, the younger generation that are are right now like immersed in it. And and, and you add this other layer, which is that sometimes people are talking about you. <laughs> right? Like that's part of the social engagement. They're talking about you in ways where they don't have to feel responsible to you. And so it gets complicated. It gets really, really complicated. Our brains are craving it and there's content about us in the world that um, uh, the person who's saying it doesn't have the responsibility of what it feels like to say it in, in front of you. So uh, that, that's that's part of it. The other part is that the, the present moment, until you get deep into the nuances of the present moment, it can feel really boring at the surface, right? Like yeah. f- focusing on your breathing is not as stimulating as flipping <laughs> through social media, mm-hmm. right? Or or talking about some sort of drama of whatever you're interested in. So when people are fatigued, they look to stimulants. And right now, our model that our ancestors gave us, and, and when I say ancestors, I mean like two or three generations ago from the Industrial Revolution, they were they that workforce was being replaced by machines. So what did they say to each other? You need to work harder. And that's what they said to our kid, to the kids. You need to work harder. You need to be better at what you do because machines are replacing you. So we've de- we have developed subtly this model that we need to do more to be more. And what's taken place for us is that we are tired. We're fatigued. We're working more than we've ever worked. We are more distracted than we've ever been distracted. We're sleeping less than we've ever slept. We're more fractured from the present moment than we were you know, just 50 years ago. And so we need to flip that model on its head and help each other understand how to be more and let the doing flow from there. Be more what? Be more authentic, be more present, be more grounded, be more you and let the doing that you want to do flow from there. And that and that's the calling for the next generation, for, for us now and the generations going forward is to the enhanced performance will come from the grounded being as opposed to the exhausted and fatigued doer. I'm so glad you brought that up, 
Michael, because I've I've heard you say that, you know, in a number of podcasts, you know, the doing more to be more. But at the same time, I wrestle with it because we know that you have to put in the work, right? Tom and I are in sales. And if you don't have the focus and put in the work, you're not going to see the results. And, you know, Tom played tennis competitively in college. I used to wrestle. So how do you balance the putting in the work with the being more? I, I'm so glad you brought that up because I, I was just dying to ask you that question. Uh, yeah, very cool. Yeah. Okay. On the world stage, when you pull back the curtain on the world stage of whatever sport you want to look at, even arts, um, we don't talk about working hard. Everybody works hard, ridiculously hard, almost as hard as a human can work. So we spend more time talking about the science and art of recovery. So I, I'm glad you brought it up because it is an assumption that if you want to experience extraordinary consistently and you want to, to go the distance to understand your potential and reveal it and live a life that is like stimulating because of all the things you get to learn and experience from being incredible at what you do, that you have to work ridiculously hard, nauseating, nauseatingly, uncommonly hard. And okay, so that's that's like just a prerequisite. That doesn't mean that that we have the model right. So it's a model that I'm talking about, not an effort. Um, so I'm not suggesting by being more to do more that you change the work ethic and the intensity. By no means necessary. I'm saying get the order correct. Mm -hmm. So know who you are, be you, have the mental skills to be grounded, be present, be here in the present moment more often, and then let the doing that you're exceptional at flow from there. Wow. Yeah. And, and I, I hope I get the name of this right. I think it's called Parkinson's Law, right? Where if you have a, a, a certain amount of work and you have five hours, it takes you five hours. If you have 30 minutes, it takes you 30 minutes. Um, I might have the name wrong, um, but um, I find that to be true that, you know, you can still work really hard, um, but if you, you don't necessarily need to put in 18 hour days to get the, the amount of work you need done. Um, so I think that's, it's, it's refreshing to hear that in a world where everyone almost brags about lack of sleep. And I think a lot of, a lot of us have done it and I've done it, I'm sure in the past too of, uh, you know, I, I worked this many hours. I only got five hours of sleep last night. Look how hard I'm working. When in reality, um, it's it's almost your it's a disservice to yourself that you're bragging about. Yeah, f f yeah. So that was, but that was, if you think about the arc of that story, which is a number of years ago, the model was, hey, you need to do more because machines are taking our jobs. Then at some point, it became a bragging right. Man, I'm a grinder. I'm doing everything it takes. <laughs> and you put up your hand, and you're like. You know, like uh, who's getting six hours sleep? And if you say that now, what science would suggest to you is that if you're getting six or below hours of sleep, most people, and I'm going to, I'm using the averages and the law of average here, is that you're putting up your hand saying, I, I'm, I'm raising my hand saying, I am completely sub average from a brain and psychological standpoint. That's who I am. Right now. <laughs> you know, like I'm exhausted and you can tell barely. <laughs> and, you know, like what science would suggest or has found is that if you're at five hours sleep, for five days. Okay. Now, again, this is the majority of people. Every, there's freaks in every domain, right? If you think about world-class athletes, there are some on the world stage that eat the worst food you can imagine, but they just dominate. They're like f literally freaks. I'm not talking about those people right now. I'm talking about mm -hmm. the, the, the majority of people when you do, when they sleep for five hours for five days, they measure on vigilance and focus tests at the same response rate as somebody who's 0 0.08 um, alcohol content. Man, that's that's crazy, and and that's something that um, we Ryan and I just got uh, again Patriots plug Tom Brady's book, and he talks about the importance of rest, nine hours of sleep a night, things like that. So, um, man, that's 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 crazy. It's crazy um, stat, it really is. Um, well, so so majority of people need seven to eight hours of sleep. Okay. Yeah, that's where it's you know sixty eight to seventy percent of people need. Uh, are optimal between seven and eight. So nine is for you know some, and if it's good for him, then you know he's he's that in that some category. Nice. Okay. Great. So um, we want to do a quick pivot here. Um, we have a few questions that we uh, posed from our audience um, that we want to throw at you in, in a little bit of a rapid fire manner. So um, <clears throat> you know the first. We talked a bit about the Seahawks. Um, we haven't gotten the opportunity yet to talk about uh, Felix Bumgarner. Uh, and for those that aren't aware, uh, he was the the man that 
did a free fall in 2012 sponsored by Red Bull. I think it was 24 miles high. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but we, you know, we'd love to just hear, you know, a quick take on what that experience was like and some of the self-talk that Felix had when he's doing something that astounding and, and intimidating. This is one of those lifetime opportunity projects that I think everybody that was part of the the science and the team feels like it was a, a, a life defining experience for us. And it was truly an aerospace engineer quest to understand what happens to the body if it were to travel the speed of sound without any sort of apparatus around, meaning a, a, you know, a rocket ship or whatever. And so Felix was the person who literally this project was for Felix, designed for Felix. And he ran four and a half years into the project or four years into the project they had the capsule built. Now, these are some of the brightest minds in aerospace. They had mm-hmm. the capsule built to take him up. They had the balloon designed. They had um, uh, spacesuits, you know, customized fit for him. Exactly what you would imagine from a technical, tactical, strategic standpoint, uh, physically as well. Everything was in place except for he was running into a psychological barrier. Okay, so the psychological barrier was that he had all the skills needed. And he was a very successful skydiver and base jumper to to do that in the world stage for a long time. And mind you, that if you're not good at that sport, you get you get hurt or die early. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, what is required for that sport is that you are self reliant and deeply in tune with being able to say yes, no, and being able to adjust to the the conditions. So your life is in your hands. In in this project, Felix's life was in other people's hands. Mm. And so this became a function of trust of self and trust of others in a completely new way, which is phenomenal. So he was at the edges of his capacity. Literally, uh, for most people, that, that would make a lot of sense. And what happened was he became overwhelmed by being in the suit. So he developed this claustrophobic response to being in the suit. And the suit is not that different than... Um, like a scuba suit where you you have to rely on a gas exchange for the right amount of oxygen uh, in, in your system. And so what happened for him is he was the strong man, the alpha man who put up his hand and said, guys, I've run out of mental skills. I can't do this. And that was four years into the project with millions of dollars invested in, in people's wow. full-time you know, um, work that they had invested in as well. So think about the pressure to do that. Yeah. Insane. And and that is phenomenal. I have so much respect for what he did. And that's when um, when I was introduced to the project is to help um, in an expedited way to find a solution with Felix about either to you know not to go for the project and abandon the project, or if there was if he was interested and willing to do the work, did he want to um, uh, to actually train his mind to be more comfortable in the suit? And so he chose the latter. And uh, the, the story writes itself. Well, and for those of you who haven't watched it yet, just take 20 minutes and put your headphones on and watch that video. We, we watched it last night and this morning, and I've never been more sick to my stomach. My hands are sweating. I mean, when they're giving the, the countdown for him to jump out of the capsule, it's one of the most insane things I've ever seen in my life. And next thing I know, he's going 700 miles an hour. So crazy experience. And what an honor it must have been to be a part of that. Um, oh, just, phenomenal. Just incredible. So yeah. my last uh, question here, uh, I mentioned I wrestled in college. Wait, wait, you, know, you know what? Can, can, can yeah. I share one thing with you? I think you'll enjoy yeah. this. Is that can you imagine being on the edge of that capsule, knowing that the brightest minds in aerospace were not sure, they couldn't agree that if you traveled the speed of sound, Mach 1, that that you would go through a double sonic boom and they weren't sure that if your head and your tor- torso would be traveling at one speed but the drag on your arms and legs would be going a little bit slower they weren't sure if they were going to rip off so <laughs> what so right <laughs> no that was the whole qu- that was the whole thing that was one of them you know like oh can you imagine that there's it's, I, I have so much respect for him like unbelievable unbelievable i mean 
was he conscious doing during the 700 mile an hour part or did he come back to consciousness after he slowed down a little bit he never he never lost consciousness he he, he, all, he almost he went into a flat spin which was another dangerous saw that yeah yeah very dangerous part of the experience and he worked himself out of it which was oh. a part of his uh, extraordinary skill and how he can do that cuz if he doesn't the if he doesn't, the parachute doesn't go out right, I would assume. So, I mean, that how do you, you're at 700 miles an hour spinning um, just uncontrollably, then he has the wherewithal to pull him back, pull himself back together, you know, and then pull the parachute. It's just, it's, it's crazy. Uh, yeah. and there's a 30 for 30 coming out on it. I'm sure you're aware, but I can't wait to watch it. Yeah, it's extraordinary. Uh, so, last question for me, and then we'll wrap this up. Um, I have to know this. Just for my own uh, own sanity, so huge fan of the UFC. I know you've worked with some fighters. Now, Conor McGregor is a, a man of extraordinary mental strength, and to me, he seems just undestructible. I think I know what you're going to say, but I have to ask, does he have the same fears and anxieties that the rest of us have, or is he on some special wavelength that we don't even understand? <laughs> <laughs> That's really good. I, I, I don't know Conor, but I do know that most men, most women – are operating from this the, a very similar swath of experiences and fears and, and conditions, and so most people are have fear of other dangerous humans, and so when you get close the cage door behind you, and there's seventeen thousand people that want to see blood, yours and or the others, mm -hmm. and there's millions watching, which doesn't matter to them. But the most intense experience is when you look across the cage and you know that there's an equally skilled or just about equally skilled human that you know wants to inflict harm on you. That's a really rare experience that tests the most ancient parts of our brain, the survival, the reptilian, the most ancient parts of our brain. So he could be, and, uh, and there are some, that are not affected by danger and risk at the same level that you and I. I don't know Connor, but I do know that the 90%, 95% of the people I've worked with in UFC have have the same fears, the same conditions, the same challenges that you and I would have in that experience. Their heart rate comes up. They start to think a little bit differently. Their body constricts under those um, appropriately uh, condition uh, those appropriate conditions of fear. Mm -hmm. However, they are exceptional at finding the right state. So they override their DNA. Their DNA says, get out. What are you doing? Tighten up, brace yourself because you could die. And so what they do though, they're exceptional at overriding those signals to find a more calm and appropriate calm a deep focused so that a deep focus so that they can adjust and be fluid and eloquent and express their craft at a higher level than if they were tense and tight and scared. And so it doesn't mean that they're not scared. It means that they know how to override all of those low performing tendencies in those states. So it is it is one of the great sports if you appreciate um, the consequence of harm that test the most ancient parts of our brain with just our head, our hands, and our feet. And um, it, it is hard to watch if you don't appreciate that type of intensity. Mm -hmm. And But it is an extraordinary commitment to people um, of their way to override their brain by training their mind. Yeah, that that's crazy. And finding the right state, I feel like that's um, – that's something that everyone can kind of take away too, you know, even if you're not uh, fighting a, a cage match tonight, um, if you have uh, fear over something or if you're getting you know, nervous or getting down on yourself, fighting um, that natural state to get yourself in the right state of confidence, of, of good body language, um, things like that, um, I feel like could benefit everyone. Um, a, a thousand percent, guys. I mean... And you know what the most people that you know do is they feel they feel some sort of anxiety or anxiousness, which is a low grade fear. And then what they do is to deal with that is they work harder. And then if you play that model forward for 10, 15, 20, 30 years, you just become very tired. You're a hardworking, tired human, ready for retirement. Like just get me away. Yeah. So it's not like most of us have this incredible, you know, undoing of ourself. We just work really hard, not efficient, 
Um, and with this like anxiousness under the surface that always boils. So we come home and we're a little agitated and irritated. And then what do people do? They look to do something to numb that. So they grab something to drink, they grab some food, or they look at TV, or you know, they go hang out and talk shit with the boys, whatever. And and all all of those scenarios are lower level um, uh, decisions toward potential. Doesn't mean that they're wrong every once in a while, but if that's the pattern, like an anxious uh, self, hardworking, fatigue, and then something to numb that anxiety when you're not working hard. So yeah, you could uh, very simply, we can all train our mind. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it, like we can all, it's not hard. <laughs> yeah. Like it's really not hard to do. It's being consistent uh, is the hard part. And so yeah, yeah. That, well that's. Yeah, yeah. I mean that. That's it. Um, I think that's the key of what we've learned from listening to you is that the mind is you know, training the mind and visualizing. It's untapped. Um, we're going to see more of it. Um, we know you have to go, Michael. So we'll wrap this up real quick. You, know, you mentioned you work with Microsoft. You train businesses um, and leadership teams. Um, where can we find you? And if you know a company wants to work with you, what's the best route uh, to to get in touch with you? Okay. Thank you for uh, allowing me to share like the, the ap- actual application of these insights that we've come to learn. And, okay, so there's a couple ways. Like just on social media, if there's like just interested in kind of some of the things that we've talked about today, it's social media is at Michael Gervais, Twitter, and at Finding Mastery you know, on Instagram. And so two things that we've done is we fired up a podcast, and that podcast is called Finding Mastery, where we sit down with people that are on the path of mastery to help deconstruct, to really understand their psychological framework and the mental skills that they've used to become extraordinary at what they do. So that's, um, that's one model. The second model is compete to create. So compete to create.net is the company that coach Carol and I created. And, um, and again, coach Carol is the head coach of the Seattle Seahawks. What he's, what we've done is we've created our, we fused our intellectual property. We've created a curriculum and there's an in-person experience where we've hired Olympians and sports psychologists to deliver the curriculum, and it's eight hours. And that you know, there's some challenges with the business model that is an eight-hour training curriculum. So we've also found for scale, we have a four-week online course that has had um, incredible results, and it's been fantastic for us. And during that four-week online course, you are coached. It's all about mindset training. You're coached by Olympians and sports psychologists you know, that support you, love you up, and they kick your ass and challenge you on a regular basis to do the work, to train your mind, to become your very best. And then after you exit that course, we op- we give you access to open up an app where we will continue uh, to train you for another 90 days. Um, but it's like a lower level uh, intensity. It's just more reminders at that point. So that's that's it. It's compete to create.net for that. And then finding mastery is the podcast. Excellent. Yeah. And we're going to put all of that in the show notes for everyone listening. And just one note on, on finding mastery, Ryan and I have both been listening. It's, it's awesome. Uh, if I were to recommend one, um, which is probably tough to do just one, but I would say the Luke Walton one you did a few weeks back and he talks about playing on the Lakers and, you know, growing up, obviously Bill Walton is his dad and, uh, the Kobe mindset, um, is just incredible. So I would, I would recommend that one for anyone listening to this. I think you'd love it. So. Uh, thanks, guys. You guys are great. And what you're doing is phenomenal. So nice, nice work with what you're doing and your commitment to continue to explore right on the edges of the human experience. So really nice work. Thank you, sir. We really appreciate it. We'll let you go. Um, TR Talk listeners, we'll be back next week with a new episode. Thank you for all the love and support. We'll see you guys soon. Thanks for checking out that episode. Start of the year. Let's kick some ass again. One of my goals for this show is to get as many subscribers uh, wherever you're listening here uh, on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, et cetera. Subscribe, leave a review, and then hit me up on uh, LinkedIn, Tom Alemo, uh, or any of my other socials at Tommy Tahoe. Look forward to connecting with you there. Peace.